Hey everybody, Jem Schofield of the C47 and another episode of Gearbox 2.0. In this episode, we're talking about this little sucker, the Black Magic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. So let's get started. All right, kiddos, it's another week. It's dark and dreary out there, but that means two things. One, I move out from the barn because it's too loud because of the rain and it's not ready yet. And number two, I don't have to use any ND on the windows. So that's a beautiful thing, even though I have to lug everything in here. And this episode is a little bit different than I originally intended. Really, I have this camera in-house for a very short period of time. Life got in the way. That's a longer story than we need to get into today. And what I want to do at least is give you some real thoughts on this camera. And the first place that you're going to compare to is obviously the 4K version of the Pocket Cinema camera. And they are very similar and very different in quite a few ways. Similar in form factor, which to me I'm getting used to. I would definitely rig this camera. It is not the type of camera that you take out of the bag and it feels great in the hand. Love the screen, love the user interface in terms of the UI and how you get around the menus. I think definitely one of the best in the industry now with all of their cameras, the 4K, this one, the Ursa Mini Pro. So the menu system and how you get around is exceptional. There are some things that you have to think about. I don't want to be redundant here too much because I think you've seen this, but you're going to need, if you're just going to use the body the way it comes, a lot of batteries to shoot for a day. Um, second option would be to go with the battery grip. It's going to move you into a different battery system. You're going from Canon batteries to Sony NPF style batteries, and it's the low profile 550 slash 570 batteries. Two of those in uh, there at a time. I'm powering off of mains, which you can do out of the box. And I'm in the studio, so that would be the smart way to do that. And then there are tons of third-party solutions in terms of powering this thing. So you can power through USB-C. You can power using a dummy battery. So a Canon you know, uh, LPE6 dummy battery to PTAP. Uh, to a small HD monitor. My thought is this is not the camera that you're buying for everyday um, corporate and in-house production. So it's not your run and gun camera in the traditional sense where you would expect things like built-in neutral density filters, you'd have at least two XLR inputs built into the body of the camera system. And it's not to say that you can't build this thing out and get to that point, but I think that for most people, they would be looking at other digital cinema cameras in order to do that. Now that said, what we have here is a very capable camera system that is $2,500 US for the 6K version, about $1,300 US for the 4K version. And speaking of those two different versions, where do I see that? Well, 4K if you want to shoot 4K. And I'll say that again, 4K camera, pocket cinema camera, if you want to shoot 4K. This camera is really the camera you're buying if you want to shoot 6K. So yes, it has a larger sensor, Super 35. Yes, it has EF mount. That in itself is going to be very attractive to a lot of people. But I would say that if you are looking to shoot 4K, on a day in day out basis, capture at that resolution, then you should be looking at the smaller sibling of this camera, the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Because, well, I'll show you when we get into the menus in a second why um, I feel that way. So that's really my thoughts on that. Of course, if you go with the 4K version, your micro four thirds mount, your micro four thirds sensor. You can obviously add a speed booster to get that bigger field of view. You can get that stop, uh, you know, that, that a lot of people like to get from a speed booster. But let's just go ahead and go into the menu here and just start to talk about a couple of things that I think you should be aware of. So number one, we're in the record menu area. And if we go in through here, you can see that you have these left and right arrows within each of these sections or pages. 
And um, let's go ahead and take a look at this. This is actually, let's just go here because this is the one that everybody wants to talk about, which is the difference between recording in Blackmagic RAW or recording in ProRes. Now, Blackmagic RAW, to me, amazing. Uh, not only is it supported now with DaVinci Resolve, but with the new 1.5 update, you will have support in Premiere Pro and Avid Media Composer. Come on, I'm really hoping that this whole Blackmagic RAW, ProRes RAW thing isn't going to prevent this from being supported in Final Cut Pro 10. Double fingers crossed. Um, but let's take a look at this page here and see what we've got. And under Blackmagic RAW, we have two choices in terms of bitrate. We can do a constant or a um, consistent quality. So the big difference here is that when you're doing a constant bitrate, 3 to 1, 5 to 1, 8 to 1, 12 to 1, um, what you're basically doing is you're keeping that data rate exactly the same and consistent the entire time that you're recording. And there's so much data and the, you know, the type of compression that's being used and what you're getting out of this camera is so rich in terms of the recorded image that this is going to be just great for most people. If you want constant quality, then there's two settings here that basically are variable bitrate um, versions of Blackmagic RAW where you have a lowest data rate and then as needed when it's evaluating what's being captured it will basically increase that data rate when you are recording. So you'll have to do a little bit of research into that but the most important thing to notice besides those two options is that when you are in Blackmagic RAW you will see that certain resolutions are available to you. And lo and behold, if you look down here on the bottom right, you'll see that in Blackmagic RAW on this camera, you do not have 4K resolutions available to you. So that's the one, well, it's not the one thing, but it's a big thing to consider when you are deciding between different cameras. We can get to those 4K resolutions when we switch the camera over to ProRes, and you'll see that those light up, but then in ProRes, we don't have those other resolutions like 6K, 5.7K, so on and so forth. And if you're going to be shooting anamorphic, you're out of luck, at least in terms of natively shooting in that 3.7K anamorphic resolution, unless you're shooting in Blackmagic RAW. For a lot of people, this is not a deal breaker because for a lot of people, the whole reason that they bought the camera is they want to shoot in 6K. They want to have access to all of these. They want to work with Blackmagic RAW. So you just have to really know that the big gotcha is that if you want to shoot natively in 4K, you have to do it on this camera in ProRes. That's not true of the 4K camera. You can shoot in 4K resolutions in Blackmagic RAW on that particular camera. So next page under record, we make decisions in terms of our dynamic range. We have up to 13 stops of dynamic range in here. Um, most people are not going to use video. That's sort of like old school Rec. 709. Extended video is more of a wide dynamic range version, so you're going to eke out a couple of extra stops. You would expect, I would say, about nine stops of dynamic range is my guess when you're using extended. And that's what we're seeing, let's say, on a Canon camera when you're shooting in wide DR. It's what you'd be seeing on an Airy camera if you were shooting just regular 709. It's extended. And then we have over here film, which is essentially going to be capturing, in terms of your luminance, all 13 of those stops of dynamic range. Then we can go in here and we can dial in our frame rate. Be careful. Make sure that if you want to shoot 2398, you don't have it set to 24. We can access off-speed recording inside of here. Um, in 6K, we can go all the way up to 50 frames per second when we're doing that uh, in Blackmagic RAW. And then we can record, depending on the speed of your card, actually Blackmagic RAW to SD cards. They got to be fast. And then you can decide whether or not you're recording to your CFast card, to your SD card, to the fullest card. 
And then let's just see, we've got one more page here and this is really for your time-lapse options. And it's nice because at the bottom here, it will show you how many pages there are within a certain section. Now under monitor, we can make choices depending on what we wanna see here on the LCD, um, out of the HDMI output from the camera system. And then also there are some settings that affect both of those, meaning pushing to the internal LCD and externally over HDMI. So LCD here, you can see that I can do a clean feed. I can turn that on or off and then it grays out certain options. I can display a lot onto that screen or not. And there's ways that you can use the three assignable buttons on the top to do that. Uh, zebras can be turned on or off here. And again, some of these things can be accessed from the main home screen, but it's nice to be able to see that. HDMI, similar options, and then under both, it's really where you're starting to change some of your settings in terms of your frame guides, um, your guide opacity, your focus assist levels, what color that is. Are you looking at peaking? Are you looking at colored lines? My big kind of gotcha with this camera when it comes to zebras is you don't have a built-in waveform monitor, you have a histogram. And I'll just step out here so you can see that right here on the actual camera. Um, so when you are exposing, especially when you are exposing for the film version of this camera, I'm generally bringing in an 18% middle gray card and I like to expose that on average when I'm shooting in raw or log at about 40. So I can definitely use the histogram to do that, but if I could set my zebras to below, in this case 75, but all the way below 50 to 40, then I could actually use the gray card and those zebras to help me judge and set my exposure for middle gray. So for me, that's something I'd like to see. I'd like to be able to see those zebras go below that. Now we do have another page here under monitor and this is where you're also making additional options. Um, so let's just go ahead and take a look at that one more time. And you can see here that each of these HDMI, both each have second pages with other options that you can customize in terms of what you're seeing on your internal and external monitors. Audio here, um, pretty straightforward in terms of your audio that's coming in and setting that and you can see here there are tons of choices in here so that depending on how you're configuring your audio that's going into your camera then you can set that up inside of here. Um, really haven't done a lot of audio recording with this particular Blackmagic camera. I've done it with some of the others like the Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K and really all of this UI that you're seeing here is being borrowed from and really is that evolution that we saw from that camera system. Um, headphone volume, speaker volume because you can do playback here. Uh, you can set your audio meters and so some customization. And then we have overall setup. This is really where we start to get into some of the stuff having to do with shutter angle or shutter speed. Um, we can basically go in here and set this to be a world camera. So it can be 50 or 60 Hertz. And then you can set up your function buttons here to do different things. So I've got F1, F2, F3. There's three buttons here on the top of the camera and that's where we're setting what those are doing. And you can see here that I have some different options. For instance, under F2, I have display LUT. So if I'd step out of here and I just press that button here, you'll see that I am cycling between the unLUTed and the LUTed version of that. And then presets, you can basically go in and create your own LUTs. You can go in and actually decide what LUT you are using, uh, depending on the type of production that you are doing. And then we step out of here and we take a look at our main screen. And one of the nice things is you customize inside of the menu. And then when you're outside of here, again, carrying through what I think is one of the best user interface experiences when you're going through stuff with your camera, this is all touch based. So I can go up here in the top left and I can press on that. And here I can actually activate a lot of those tools that I was looking at inside of the menu. So if I wanted to go in here and turn on and show a grid here, I could do that very easily um, just directly from this screen. 
Then I can go in here and I can access my frame rates. You can see here that I can change that very easily. And I can also access off-speed recording directly from the main screen as well. Over here, shutter, same thing. I can go in and change that. I have the ability, though I would generally use a little dial at the front of the camera if I'm using an EF lens that has contacts and can communicate, but I can in fact change my aperture here from the menu. And then we go in here, we've got time code, we can go in and access our ISO, our white balance, which is pretty extensive. Um, one thing that you're probably gonna have to get used to is that when you're cycling through and the color science has really, um, it's really evolved on this camera in terms of what I used to see and what I'm seeing now in terms of getting accurate color. But one of the things that might trip you out a little bit is, for instance, I'm on 5600K. We click on this and you'll see that when we have that particular preset selected, it has a default tint value of 10. So what they're doing inside of here is they're giving you the ability to go more green, more magenta, but they found that under daylight, that that's the setting, that's the way I'm interpreting it, that your tint should be in an average situation. When we go to tungsten to 3200 Kelvin, there is no tint at all. Um, I don't know if that means that this particular sensor is more, um, generally CMOS likes daylight, but maybe, maybe it's more friendly for tungsten. And then we cycle through and you can see that as you go through these different presets, that there are tint values that are applied as standard ones. You can do custom white balance, you can do an auto white balance, and so you can see what those functions are right there. Um, really easy to get in here and also access your cards. Also really easy if you're not careful to format, but if I just go in here, um, you can also, which is very unusual for a camera system like this, you can format it to OS 10 extended or XFAT depending on what type of computer you're using. So obviously if you're using a PC, XFAT would make more sense, but if you're Mac-based, then it's nice to actually have that natively on a Macintosh computer. So as you can see here, lots of functionality, and then you have your histogram, and then I can even, if I want to, start recording directly from the screen instead of using the record button on the body of the camera system. So as you can see, just tons and tons of functionality here in terms of what you can do and how you can customize the camera system to use it the way you want to use it. Now, I think that if you're looking for an affordable 6K camera system that well, first of all, there aren't a lot of options, and this one should be at $2,500 US considered very seriously. Just remember what kind of camera it is. I'm thinking small commercials, music videos, narrative projects. You're going to rig this thing out. It's probably going to get built out with a follow focus system. It's probably going to get built out with a map box, some sort of cage and it's going to lean more towards those types of projects than it is for your day in, day out, run and gun style projects that some people might be doing in corporate and in-house work. It's still small to no crew, but it just sort of fits a different place. And when you are looking into a camera like this, do your research and remember, just because it shoots and records in 6K, it doesn't mean that this particular pocket cinema camera is the right pocket cinema camera for you. Definitely look at the 4K and the 6K side by side. Try to figure out which one seems to be the right kind of camera for the types of work that you're doing. And I'll see you guys next time on Gearbox.